Sister Vivian Linkauer. I am the Vice President for Mission and Identity here at Seton Hill University. Tonight's lecture is a joint project of the Sisters of Charity and Seton Hill University. It honors one of our former sister presidents and a distinguished member of our English department, Sister Mary Schmidt. The lecturer's presence here is a gift from the Sisters of Charity, the founders of this university. So we are happy to, to welcome um, our dear Sister of Charity of Nazareth, Sister Teresa Coterin. I don't know if that's as close as I could go. <laughs> and I now call on Sister Barbara Einloff, who is a member of the leadership team of the Sisters of Charity of the U.S. province, to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Sister Vivian, and welcome to this year's Sister Mary Schmidt Lecture. It's the 10th in this collaboration between the Sisters of Charity and the Seton Hill University. And on behalf of Sister Catherine Minert and all of the Sisters of Charity, I welcome you tonight and thank you for coming as we focus our attention and our energies once again on the important arena of social justice. We welcome Sister Teresa, a Sister of Charity of Nazareth, whose life and current role give her a global perspective. A native of India and with varied experience in ministry there, Sister Teresa currently serves as the non-governmental organization, NGO, representative for the Sisters of Charity Federation at the United Nations. She thus acts on behalf of 14 congregations in Canada and the US who share the charism of charity and the impetus to care for those who are living in poverty so that everybody gets raised up. In the NGO role, Sister Teresa engages regularly with others from around the world to address issues that affect the world's population. Hers is the big picture, one that encompasses the world. Sister Teresa is known for considerable research in preparation for her presentations, and she also demonstrates open-handed generosity in sharing her work for others to use in their circles of, in, of influence. I look forward to hearing her ideas tonight as she reminds us of our call to leave no one behind. And as she connects this responsibility with ways outlined in the Sustainable Development Goals to achieve such a reality. Please join me in welcoming Sister Teresa to the stage for this evening's presentation. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you, Sisters of Charity and Seton Hill University for inviting me and giving me this privilege to talk to you this evening. My talk has different steps. The first part will focus on the theme, leave no one behind, the concept. Then the second part examines the world situation, and then the next part, I take up the sustainable development goals and followed by how preferential option can help us to ensure no one is left behind. The core mantra of transforming our world 
the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is its pledge to leave no one behind and to reach those who are furthest behind first. This Universal Agenda is a plan of action for people, planet and prosperity. It seeks to restore dignity and equality to all human beings by eradicating poverty and hunger and protecting the planet from degradation through sustainable consumption and production. The agenda envisages a world of universal respect for human rights and human dignity, the rule of law, justice, equality and non-discrimination of respect for race, ethnicity and cultural diversity and of equal opportunity permitting the full realization of human potential and contributing to shared prosperity. Leaving no one behind would mean that we put the human person at the center of our agenda. It means creating fast-tracking, proactive policies and actions for the poorest and marginalized, known as progressive universalism. It is a measure to ensure people who are poor gain at least as much as those who are far better off, rather than waiting to catch up for the benefits to trickle down. The poor are always the last to benefit from a government program. We need to ensure they have access to resources and for a decent life and that they have a place at the table for participation in the institutions of power. Access would mean challenging the present power equations and wealth creation for a few. Until we address the root causes, they will remain on the margins. Engaging in the work of leaving no one behind is a challenge a challenge to change the system of justice and exploitation for justice, peace and for the flourishing of the earth and its people. For a journey to common good leading to preferential option for the poor requires that we take a long compassionate look at the world to read the signs of the times. The Vatican II document, the pastoral constitution of the church in the modern world, teaches, in every age, the church carries the responsibility of reading the signs of the times and of interpreting them in the light of the gospel, if it is to carry out its task. The term signs of the times was first used by Pope John XXIII to refer to the principal characteristics of the age that are emerging from the collective consciousness of the human community in the form of shared understandings and social movements. Pope Francis, in his address to the Pontifical Council for the promotion of new evangelization stated, how many people in so many of the existential peripheries of our time are tired and exhausted and await the church? They await us. How can we reach them? He further stated, these signs must be reread in the light of the gospel this is the moment of growth of God's kingdom. Our world view determines the values we hold and how we relate to God's people and creation. 
the devastating cry of the earth and its people is reverberated everywhere. The winners take all culture we witness today is creating anxiety and divide. Shared prosperity for all is a dream for people living in poverty. Let's take a look at the signs of our times. We are living in an increasingly polarized world of us versus them. In fact, we live in a dangerous times. The fear of the other is alienating people everywhere. Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, in his address to the General Assembly in September 2018, said, the best selling brand today is indeed fear. Our world is suffering from a bad case of trust deficit disorder. People are feeling troubled and insecure. Trust is at a breaking point. Trust in the national institutions, trust among states, trust in the rules-based global order. The international order is in turmoil. Around the globe, many democracies are electing new leaders who are embracing nationalism and authoritarianism. Many of them are espousing populism, which celebrates narrow social and political identities, which vilify minorities and migrants. Liberal democracies are becoming less liberal and tolerant. Multilateralism is under siege, giving way to transactional politics. The UN Security Council is paralyzed by geopolitical games. The International Criminal Court is ignored and disparaged. The world lacks leaders with integrity to critique the unjust global order. Fake news is flourishing the play and taking the place of independent journalism. Hate speech, hate crimes, killing of human rights defenders, racism, xenophobia and intolerance are on the rise and they are the real threats to human rights, peace and sustainable development. <coughs> the world is confronted with more than 40 active conflicts along with the challenges of climate change, terrorism, natural disasters, displacement, migration, trade and tariff wars. Post Second World War globalization is the result of planning by politicians to break down the borders hampering trade. It was also driven by the advancements in science and technology and the global expansion of the multinational corporations based in the United States and Europe. Globalization is in many ways considered as the principal driver of global economic growth. It is true many benefited from this growth but vast numbers of developing countries and their people had no share in the prosperity, globalization and technological progress ushered in. In fact, they bore the brunt of the economic and structural adjustments and ended up being left behind, burdened with huge debts and no money for basic services and infrastructure development. The division between the haves and the have-nots 
is increasing. The World Commission on the Social Dimensions of Globalization report of 2004 states, for the vast majority of women and men, globalization has not met their simple legitimate aspirations for decent jobs and better future for their children. Many of them live in the limbo of informal economy without formal rights and in a sway the poor countries that subsist precariously on the margins of global economy. Some of the concerns raised by the Commission are the rules of the game that govern globalization are unfair, specifically designated, designed to benefit the advanced industrial countries. Globalization advances material values over other values such as a concern for the environment or for life itself. The way globalization has been managed has taken away much of the developing countries' sovereignty and their ability to make decisions for themselves in key areas, undermining democracy. The economic system has been pressed or forced upon the developing countries is inappropriate and often damaging. Globalization should not mean Americanization of their economic policy and culture. The voices of the developing countries are not, not heard at the tables where international economic decision making and norm setting and global economic governance take place. Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz says, the way globalization is currently managed is not consistent with democratic policies. The International Monetary Fund, charged with the oversight of the global financial system, has a single country with veto power. It is not a question of one country, one vote, dollars vote. Countries with the largest economies have the most votes. Votes are determined on the basis of the economic power at the time IMF was established 73 years ago. The old narrative is no longer applicable to meet the current challenges. A new pathway had to be created for a paradigm shift. The Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs embraced by the heads of states from around the world in 2015 is truly a bold, aspirational, universal and ambitious agenda applicable to all countries. It is built on the developments that have taken place during the past 25 years on human rights principles and international labor standards. It reflects the outcome of the 1992 Earth Summit and the achievements of the Millennium Development Goals constituted for developing countries in the year 2000. The 17 SDGs and the 169 targets are integrated and indivisible and balance the three dimensions of sustainable development. They encompass the social, economic and environmental aspects of development and shine a new light on our world order. Sustainable development is more than just caring about the environment or generating more money through economic growth. It is the intersection of the three pillars 
It is a holistic approach which promotes integrated thinking. Sustainability invites us to look at everything as parts of a whole and each part impacting one another. Sustainable development meets the needs of today without compromising the needs of future generations. It is essential to see how the principles of Catholic social teaching are reflected in the 2030 Agenda before we take a look at each of the goals to see who are being left behind. The principle of the, on the dignity of the human person teaches every human being is created in the image and likeness of God and redeemed by Jesus Christ. The agenda states that sustainable development must be at the service of human dignity for the development of the whole person. This is reflected in its focus to eradicate poverty and hunger, to ensure a life of dignity to all people living in poverty. It is further upheld in the human rights language used to frame the goals and the targets and the call to implement them from a rights-based approach. Solidarity is the conviction that we all belong to one human family. We have the mutual obligations to promote the rights and development of all people across communities, nations and the world irrespective of the national boundaries. In particular, the rich nations have responsibilities toward the few poor nations and people with wealth and resources are linked to the divine economy with those who lack them. The 2030 Agenda commits to strengthen global partnerships for sustainable development based on a spirit of global solidarity focused on the needs of the poorest and most vulnerable. Care of creation. The need to respect and share the resources of the earth is highlighted by the commitment to protect the planet from degradation, sustainable consumption and production, sustainably managing earth's resources and taking urgent action on climate change. The environmental problems are not separate from the social and economic problems. There is compatibility with the encyclical Laudato Si of Pope Francis. In fact, the encyclical brings the needed moral, ethical and spiritual dimensions to sustainable development. Now let us examine each SDG to see where the challenges lie from a global and national perspective to find a point of insertion for action and do pay attention to the repeated use of inclusive and for all in the longer version of the goals. Goal 1 is end poverty in all its forms everywhere. Extreme poverty is a human rights violation. Primary reason for extreme poverty is inequality. Poverty is a human construct. It is the structural barriers that we have built into the economic, social and political systems to exclude people. Poverty is not just not having sufficient income. 
people who are living in poverty experience as multi-dimensional that they are deprived of social, political, cultural rights. They lack access to basic services. Multi-dimensional poverty looks at three dimensions of education, health care and living standards. Our trust in the market and the trickle-down theory is a myth. Market doesn't correct itself. So, people are excluded at multiple levels, pushing them into generational poverty. Extreme poverty affects 736 million people who live on either $1.90 or less a day. Poverty in the U U.S. according to the UN Special Rapporteur for Poverty is 40 million people. That is 12% of Americans live in poverty. End hunger, achieve food security and improved nutrition and promote sustainable agriculture. Food is a human right. Poverty is the number one cause of hunger. 870 million people go hungry every day and 60% of them are women. At the same time, we waste one third of all the food we produce, that is 1.3 billion tons from the farm to the kitchen table. <coughs> Goal four, three is ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. TB and non-communicable diseases are on the increase. In the past, a lot of money and research was spent to control communicable diseases. But today we need to focus on prevention and control of non-communicable diseases. NCDs or non-communicable diseases are responsible for 71% of all deaths today. That is 41 million deaths. In the U.S., the concerns are U.S. spends $3.5 billion on health care. It is the highest in the world. Yet, 27 million people are uninsured. There is no paid maternity leave and benefits for women in America. Drug overdose, overdose deaths are very high, 130 people die every day. In the year 2017, 70,000 people died of drug overdose. Mental health issues are on the rise. There are 10.4 million mental health patients in this country. The US life expectancy used to be high, but today it is lagging behind other developed countries. Ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. Goal 4.7 focuses on education for sustainable lifestyles. We need to include that as part of our education. We need to include human rights, gender equality, culture of peace and non-violence, global citizenship and appreciation for global diversity, cultural diversity. Globally, 265 million 
students are out of school. 63 million are primary school age. In the US, one of the major concerns is student loan debt. It is 1.56 trillion spread between 45 million Americans. There is an increased educational segregation happening and also the quality of the education offered in the public school system and for minorities is not on par with the rest of the systems. Achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. Gender equality is not only a fundamental human right but a necessary foundation for a peaceful, prosperous and sustainable world. The biggest barrier to women's economic empowerment are the unpaid care work and domestic work they provide at home and in the society. Also, this unpaid care work restricts them from pursuing education, skills training and taking up jobs. They also lack access to decent jobs. According to the UNDP report on gender equality, it is estimated that the unpaid care work of women today amounts to as much as 10 trillion dollars of output per year, roughly estimated to be 13% of the global GDP. Child marriage is another concern. 750 million women and girls have alive today were married before the age of 18. One in three women experience physical and sexual violence, that is domestic violence. Five million girls and women are forced into sexual exploitation. Women in the US are concerned about the lack of the government's ratification of the convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women, in short called CEDO. The US signed it, but they have not ratified it. Since it is a concern for gender equality, many of the US cities have adopted it. So you have a program called Cities for CEDO. The Equal Rights Amendment, do you follow it? It was passed in 1972. It still waits for one state's ratification for a federal ratification. The gender pay gap in the US, a woman earns 79 cents to a dollar a man earns. But women of color and other minorities Lift receive up to 60 cents to a dollar. Domestic violence, 10 million women and men experience domestic violence today. Do you know 200,000 child marriages took place between the year 2000 and 2015 in the United States? 48 states Child marriage is legal. Human trafficking and modern day slavery, many may think it happens elsewhere, but any given day, more than 400,000 people are in modern day slavery. Goal 6, ensure availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. Water and sanitation is a human right. 
Two billion people drink unsafe water. 2.4 billion people have lack access to improved sanitation. Girls drop out of schools in developing countries because there is no accessibility water and sanitation once they reach the age of puberty. Water is a woman's issue. Women and girls spend 200 million hours every day collecting water. 200 million hours a day. Only 3% of the earth's water is fresh and 70% of that fresh water is used for agriculture. And the rest of the water is contaminated by the 80% of untreated wastewater going back into nature. Goal 7. Ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable and modern energy for all. The global share of renewable energy will be 22.5 percent by the year 2020. USA produces only 13 percent of its energy from renewables. The rest you can see from this slide what is happening. Coal is the cheapest form of energy but it is the dirtiest and it destroys landscapes, habitats, displaces communities, contaminates groundwater, it creates air and water pollution. There are 1.1 million active gas wells in the US and fracking, each fracking site requires 40,000 gallons of chemicals, 8 million gallons of water, 600 different chemicals injected into 10,000 below feet, feet below the earth. So you can see why you want to continue to use dirty fossil fuels. Goal 8, promote sustained, inclusive and sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment and decent work for all. Today, our job does not guarantee the ability to escape poverty. 2 billion people are employed in the informal sector where working conditions are substandard and lack contracts or tenure. You can be let go of your job at the drop of a hat. So only 45% of all salaried people work full time in the world. Worldwide, 64 million unemployed youth and 145 million young workers live in poverty. We need 212 million jobs today in the world. And by 2030, we will need 600 million jobs. There is a lot of discrimination that people who are minorities People with disabilities, women and youth and migrants face in getting a decent job. According to the International Labour Organization, the future of work, they say, advancements in artificial intelligence, automation and robotics will create vast opportunities and increased joblessness and inequalities. So it is one outweighs the other. Skills in demand today will not match tomorrow's needs. Acquisition of new skills and lifelong learning will be the new requirement. 
the gig economy that is trending today. Do you know what the gig economy is? The Uber, the Lyft, you know, all those, your part-time job that you do from your home for computers and all those things, that's called the gig economy. 55 million Americans are employed in the gig economy. Consistency, there are challenges to this gig economy. You need to consistently upgrade your skills. Deal with inconsistent income, less stability, absence of protections and benefits like paid sick leave, vacation time, insurance, they incur high costs on gas, health insurance, retirement plans, workers are living in increased level of anxiety. The next board is, one thing I want to ask, students be prepared for the future of work and Seton Hill University prepare new courses to meet that demand. Build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization and foster innovation. In this country, infrastructure has gone to the dogs. <laughs> innovation is happening elsewhere. There is always talk of infrastructure, but nothing, nothing on the ground. Reduced inequalities within and among countries. Growing divide between rich and poor is one of the most pressing challenges of our time. Within country inequality is greater than 25 years ago. What a person earned in 1980, $16,000, it is still today the $16,000. So the rich and poor there is much more distance. The richest 1% control 40% of all global assets. According to the Oxfam report, 26 billionaires own as much as 3. Point billion of the poorest people's wealth. That is one half of the world's population. And they kept adding two and a half billion dollars every day to their wealth. While 3.4 billion people in the world live on less than five and a half dollars. Make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. Sorry. 3.5 billion people today live in cities, in urban centers. And by 2050, it will be 6.5 billion because opportunities are in the cities in urban areas. So, cities only occupy 3% of the Earth's land base. But they use 60 to 80% of all the energy. And they account for 70% of all the emissions. But they lack infrastructure, they lack waste management, there is not sufficient affordable housing and pollution uh, is a huge challenge. Seven million people die a year of pollution alone. Goal 11.1 .1 is about access for all to adequate, safe and affordable housing and basic services and to upgrade slums. Today, 883 million people live in slums in the world. Homelessness is a huge concern for all countries today. Globally, 150 million people are homeless. There is no agreed definition 
either in any country or at the UN to you know, describe who is really homeless. In the US, one out of 30 children, that is two and a half million a year are homeless. Two million youth are homeless. One million college going students are homeless in the US. You want to get engaged at the local level? Here are the issues. The Vincentian family, when it celebrated its 400th anniversary, took homelessness to eradicate homelessness at the global level as a commitment. So we NGOs who belong to the Vincentian family at the UN initiated a group called Working Group to End Homelessness and we have managed through advocacy to get affordable housing and social protection for all to address homelessness in the coming year's Commission for Social Development meeting in 2020. So that is a success story for advocacy. Goal 12 is ensure sustainable consumption and production patterns. Efficient management of natural resources will define the quality of life and sustainability. Making the material footprint this consumption just doesn't mean all that we eat. It is the consumption that we extract from the earth, whether through production or agriculture or through extractive industries. So that is everything. So the material footprint, total amount of raw materials extracted globally across the entire supply chain to meet the consumption demand is the real challenge. And if all the developing world people try to catch up with America at the level of your consumption, we will need four Earths. Take urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts. Climate change is real and it is impacting people everywhere, whether you are a believer or a denier of human contribution to global warming. Four of the warmest years on record were 2015, 2016, 17 and 18. Experiences of extreme droughts, floods, hurricanes, forest fires, rising sea levels, etc. by people living in this country and around the world will validate the rising warming of the earth. The IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report of October 2018 lays out the urgency needed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. The wake-up call was ignored by the 197 countries who gathered in Katowice, Poland in December 2018 for COP Conference of Parties 24. The governments demonstrated their moral failure and unwillingness to create a climate's just pathway, directions and guidelines to implement the Paris Climate Agreement which comes into force in 2020. Since the leaders are failed, the students are leading the fight to take action on climate change across the world. Climate change is impacting migration because climate change is affecting weather patterns, cultivation, drought, so people are forced to move. Sustainable development, money needed to use for, used for sustainable development is meeting humanitarian issues as a result of natural disasters. 
peace and security. There is violence when there is less water or problems. Air and water problems. People are moving. Climate change, rising temperatures, rising risks. People who have contributed the least to, to greenhouse gas emissions, the small islands, the least developed countries, the landlocked countries, they are impacted and they are paying the price. Conserve and sustainably use the oceans, seas and marine resources for sustainable development. Oceans are an integral part of Earth's ecosystem and critical sustainable development. They cover two-thirds of the Earth's surface and contain 97% of the planet's water. Three billion people depend on coastal biodiversity and the oceans for their livelihoods. Three billion. Human activity is degrading our oceans. The challenges are declining fish stock, ocean acidification, bleaching of coral reefs, coastal water pollution, human-made noise from industrial, military and navy activities threaten the fragile ecosystem. If you have not seen the movie Sonic Sea, please do see it. We dump plastic waste 8 million tons a year into the oceans. Industrial fishing, which often supports slave labor, is affecting the livelihoods of the small fishing folks. Deep sea mining, having depleted the terrestrial mineral deposits, countries are staking claims to deep sea mining of minerals. Current exploratory phase will soon move into exploitation phase. The process will destroy the geological features of the seabed and biodiversity. The UN is currently going through a process of intergovernmental negotiations to come out with a convention to protect the seas that is beyond the territorial waters of each country. Life on land. Protect, restore, promote sustainable use of terrestrial systems, sustainably manage, compact desertification, and halt and reverse land degradation and halt biodiversity loss. Current reality, shrinking forest coverage everywhere. The most impacted is the Amazonia. The Pope has called for a synod on the Amazonia this year. Loss of land coverage by vegetation. Land degradation, desertification, decline in all species, mammals, birds, amphibians, corals and vegetation. Goal 16, promote peaceful, inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. This refers to our governance and justice systems. One of the targets is to reduce violence. The world is failing to recognize the early warning signs of rising conflicts in different parts of the world. Even if they do recognize, there is no political will to invest money for peace building efforts. So they you know, become major wars and conflicts which is very good for the arms selling countries. You can fill your pockets. 
there is no way we are willing to reduce the military budgets. The U.S. Sends, spends 32 million dollars an hour since 2001. Every hour the United States is sending, spending 32 million dollars. It is data, I am not making it up. Pope Francis, Pope Paul VI has said, if you want peace, work for justice. World over, our institutions are not providing justice to the poor and the marginalized. Our prisons are overcrowded. The US alone has 3 million prisoners, the highest in the world, and you have only over 300 million population. Every minute, 20 people are displaced because of wars, armed conflicts, violence. 68.5 million people are displaced worldwide. 603 million people live in countries where domestic violence is not a crime. In the year 2015, 1,069 human rights defenders and journalists were killed because they were doing the unpleasant job for the countries. Corruption, bribery, theft, tax evasion, etc. cost developing countries $1.26 trillion a year. Yes. 7.6 trillion dollars are stashed away in tax havens. The developing goal 17 is partnership for sustainable development. The developing countries do not have sufficient money to do all this work to develop. 40 years ago, the developed world promised because they had their money on colonialism and trade from other developing countries. So they have promised 0.7% of their GNP to support developing countries. I just got an email today and I looked. Only four countries have given either 0.7% or more. Those are the Nordic countries. The U.S. has given only 0.14%. So we have not met the needs. So it is for collaboration. Sustainable development implementation requires trillions. So you need partnerships between developed and developing. That is called North-South, South-South, public-private, Civil society, everyone needs to collaborate. So that is on all the 17 goals. Now I shall go back to my, pick up my talk. Because without having a glance at these, we don't know who are the people left behind. It is gone here. <coughs> Sorry for the waste of time. <laughs> Sustainable development goals and targets are silent about eradicating the causes and effects of racism and racial ethnic discrimination. The declaration of the agenda references rule of law, equality and non-discrimination, 
respect for race, ethnicity and cultural diversity. Goal 16 appears to reduce violence and abuse, exploitation, promotion of the rule of law, access to justice and participation in all the decision making. Hence, it is fitting to elaborate on racial justice, injustice we experience in our world today and find ways to work for racial justice and reconciliation. As Christians we believe we are created in the image and likeness of God and have inherent human dignity. Yet, throughout history, we have overlooked this cornerstone of our faith and embraced racial prejudice at the individual and structural levels to exclude, discriminate, dehumanize and deny justice and <coughs> to people who are different from us. The UN General Assembly Resolution 70-140 states, all human beings were born free and equal in dignity and rights and has the potential to contribute constructively to the development and well-being of their societies and that any doctrine of racial superiority was scientifically false, morally contemptible, socially unjust and dangerous and must be rejected together with theories that attempted to determine the existence of separate human races. World over, people are discriminated through social class, economic wealth, political power and cultural practices. The 2016 report of the UN Secretary General on racism states Despite some progress in combating racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia and related intolerance, these phenomena remain widespread. No country is or can claim to be free from these forms of discrimination. In India, where I come from, racism takes the form of caste. Though banned in the constitution, it is practiced widely. It impacts 300 million people, condemning them to live on the margins. The consequences of our conscious, unconscious beliefs and biases are very visible at the national and global stages. Vilifying and criminalizing the other, filling the prisons with people of color and the detention centers with migrants, refugees, asylum seekers and their children. Systemic racism that we uphold through public policies, institutional practices and cultural narratives perpetuate racial inequalities and hierarchical domination of one group over other groups. They also control how resources are allocated and the quality of the public services offered to the minority marginalized groups. African Americans, indigenous peoples, Hispanics and other minorities. The Flint water contamination and the Keystone pipeline are a few examples to highlight that practice. People of color face structural barriers to access quality housing, healthcare, employment, education, and justice. Racism is a hydra-headed evil that persists in our hearts and cultures. White supremacy is gaining ascendance in certain parts of our world. In heightened, the resulting in heightened rhetoric and violence. The lessons learned from the crimes against humanity, the killing of six million Jews and others during World War II, the Balkan and the Rwandan genocides, 
are fading from our memory, collective memories. Violent forms of anti-Semitism have taken the lives of many innocent people in this country and elsewhere. The Tree of Life synagogue shooting on October 27th in Pittsburgh, killing 11 people, is fresh in your memory. Islamophobia, that is aversion or fear of people who practice Islam, that is also vilifying and killing people. The pre-planned indiscriminate cruel killing of 50 Muslims during Friday prayer in Christchurch, New Zealand demonstrates the hatred we harbor in our hearts. We have sinned individually and collectively, for we fail to love our neighbors as Christ demands of us. The large movements of refugees and migrants fleeing armed conflicts, war, terrorism, persecution, land grabs, climate change, disasters, and displacement caused by large-scale economic development have created the phenomenon called xenophobia. Xenophobia is defined as fear or hatred of strangers or foreigners or anything that is strange or foreign. The fear of the other has resulted in policing of our borders without in adhering to international laws. At a deeper level, these actions are meant to maintain racial, ethnic purity and identity while denying the humanity of others. To counter xenophobia, the UN rolled out the Together campaign in 2017 to promote global action in support of non-discrimination and acceptance of refugees and migrants to provide respect, safety and dignity for all. The call to end racism is on all of us to engage in a process of dialogue for truth and reconciliation resulting in a new understanding and new relationships. The call to preferential option for the poor and vulnerable means placing the needs of people living in poverty first and seeking common good of the society as a whole. It is a commitment to the poor for their active participation in the life of the society and to work for structural changes leading to the fullness and richness of their humanity. Simply put, it is social justice at the heart of the mission of the church. The longing for justice has always been a central element in all major faith traditions. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, it has been strong and a predominant theme from the earliest biblical times to the present. In the Old Testament, the term, the poor, refers to people who are economically deprived with no social status and treated unjustly by their foreign or their own rulers. They are poor because they are oppressed. The Old Testament always conveys the message that God hears the cry of the poor and God is on their side. For God sent prophets to protest against the injustices heaped on them and to proclaim God's care. In the New Testament, we see Jesus emptying himself so as to become poor and to share our humanity. In Luke 4, 18, Jesus declares, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring the good news to the poor, to the afflicted. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives, 
sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free. Jesus' special concern for the poor, the marginalized and the sinner is central feature in Luke's parables of the Good Samaritan, the prodigal son and the widow and the unjust judge. Jesus consistently stood with the poor. Throughout history, the church had been on the side of the poor, yet it had not publicly expressed it until Pope Leo XIII issued the encyclical Rerum Novarum on the condition of labor. It provided a basis for the emergence of the concept of social justice in theology and church teaching. In spite of the developments of the Catholic social teaching over the years, there were instances when the church was perceived to be on the side of the rich and powerful in certain parts of the world. With the teachings of Pope John 23 and Vatican II, a visible shift took place to be on the side with the struggles of the poor. The church in the modern world states the joys and hopes, the sorrows and anxieties of the women and men of this age, especially those who are poor and in any way oppressed, are the joys and hopes, the sorrows and anxieties of the followers of Christ. The term preferential option for the poor was first used by Father Pedro Arupe, the Superior General of the Jesuits in 1968. The term had profound influence on the Latin American church for poverty was one of their predominant experiences in the 60s. The Latin American bishops who gathered in Medellin in 1968 stated that we cannot remain indifferent in the face of the tremendous social injustice existent in Latin America, which keeps the majority of our people in dismal poverty, which in many cases becomes inhuman wretchedness. In 1979, at Tupibela, they titled a section of their document, Preferential Option for the Poor. This concept was embraced and made popular by the Liberation Theology Movement. In 1991, Pope John Paul II used the term and expanded to include spiritual as well as material poverty in his encyclical Sendesimus Annus, the 100th anniversary of Rerum Novarum. Preferential option calls us to stand on the side of the poor who have been excluded from the social, political and economic arenas and denied the opportunity to flourish because of the oppressive structures the rich and powerful have built over the years. The rulers and politicians of our time have torn a page out of the Pharaoh's narrative. They are propagating an economy of scarcity to a people who live in fear and anxiety as a result of the exploitation and degradation of the environment, economy and the social fabric of their life. We forget that our God is a God of abundance. God creates sufficient for the needs of everyone. For Gandhi had said, there is enough for everyone's need, but not for everyone's greed. Saint Vincent de Paul, known as the saint of the poor and systemic change, whose charism of charity we follow focused on people living in poverty and his concern for the whole person led him to embrace holistic 
approach to caring for people living in poverty. Vincent not only read the signs of the times, but he also anticipated them from his life experiences. And he responded to social problems he confronted with bold initiatives. Vincent taught his followers to do what is before you. To do what is before us, we need to be attentive to the signs of the times, to the here and now. We need to ask in the light of the gospel, what do people living in poverty, those who are being left behind, need from us today? What must be done? How must it be done? How will this action affect those in need? Vincent also taught us love is inventive to infinity. This inventiveness that Vincent talks about is not the creation of innovative tools and methods. It can be rather it is creativity rooted in our relationship with God. It can be summed, summed up in the words of Gustavo Gutierrez, the ultimate reason for commitment to the poor and oppressed does not lie in the social analysis that we employ or in our common compassion, human compassion, or commitment to st commitment strike our commitment strikes its root in the deep gratuity of God's love and is demanded by that love. God's preferential love for the poor is motivated by their pain and God's desire that all people live lives of dignity and abundance. Love poured out ultimately desires the end of suffering as well as the end to the cause of suffering. Structural transformation is required. An option for the poor does not imply an option against the rich. Rather, it is an option against social sin and structural injustice. Dorothy Day, a saint of our times, has said, nothing is going to change until we stop accepting this dirty, rotten system. <laughs> we are called to locate ourselves in the heart of creation, to become a prophetic presence and look at the world through the lens of sustainable development goals and Laudato Si to provide creative, innovative responses to the challenges we face. A personal and a communal study of these documents should lead to a transformative consciousness, a liberating experience I forgot. <laughs> anyway, a personal communal study should give us a liberating experience, urging us to ensure no one is left behind. Franciscan sister Ilya Dilio calls us to live in conscious, <clears throat> conscious evolution, to be engaged in our unfinished universe as co-creators of justice, peace, mercy, and compassion. As you listened, which goal challenged you the most? Identify at least one goal that you want to study and engage at the local or national level, either through direct service or through advocacy, 
leaving no one behind through a preferential option for the poor requires networking, collaboration and partnerships with others for social, economic and environmental justice. And finally, I like to leave you with a challenge that Sister Carol Sin, a sister of St. Joseph, placed before the Union of International Superiors General in Rome. What if we committed to transforming our world view, transforming our capacity for compassion, transforming our comfortable comfort zones, transforming our complacency, transforming our inertia. What if we partnered with each other and others to do the hard work of transformation? Thank you. Thank you, Sister Teresa. Was the world big? Was the picture big? And do you feel, as I do, that um, we need lifelong learning to just dig in to all that you presented tonight? But as Sister Teresa said, we can't do it all, so which goal are you going to pursue? And for which one will you seek to do something right where you are, and get the ball rolling. That's the challenge we have. Thank you for being here and for sharing in this big <laughs> presentation. Thank you very much.